Welcome to the Genealogy Happy Hour, a place where new family historians can learn to document their family histories and celebrate their new discoveries. I'm Amy. And I'm Penny. And we're here to help you discover your family tree from the beginning. Welcome to episode 27. Um, We are going to be talking about a deeper dive into vital records um, in the next few podcasts. Episodes. And... um, Today we're gonna we're gonna do a deeper dive into the birth records and what secrets they hold for us that mm-hmm. you know, maybe things you haven't thought of or or things they can lead you to. Um, but before we get into all of that, um, we're gonna start with our wine. Of course, we had a lot of great wine over the holidays. We did, and one of those was a. a blush wine, a rosé from Spain from the. Kepe wine winery in Spain, uh, and it was a delicious rosé. My French brother-in-law loved it, (laughs) so I shared. um, You gave it to me for Christmas. One of the ones Mm -hmm. you gave me for Christmas, and I shared it with him. And he, because he's from South of France, and he loves the that rosé. They drink that rosé all summer long. But yeah, he really liked that 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 wine. So it was. It's a little, um, um, a little. Dry, drier, and yeah, drier and lemony, yeah, yeah exactly. So, but yeah, um, love yep. the rosé, yeah. But so it was good, very, very good. So Excellent. we would definitely, definitely recommend that. Recommending that mm-hmm. one. Um, <clears throat> we also have a challenge out this year. I'm saying year because I'm challenging myself as well. Um, and it's more your challenge. It than is mine. my challenge. <laughs> Amy's Amy's got full time genealogy work to do, so she doesn't have a lot of time for all these challenges, but. It's working out really great for me so far. So my challenge for myself and for all of you is to just answer a question a week or a question a month if you're super busy and um, you know don't have a lot of time to donate to your genealogy research or or just you know. Sometimes. I can I can handle one question a month. I think. Handle, okay. I think so. That's awesome. All right. <laughs> So I started off with um, a question that I did blog about, and I'm not going to go into the whole thing on the blog. You can read it. It's not long. But I wanted to know if there was a death certificate or some sort of proof of my great-grandfather Millard Stevens' death. To this point, we nobody has ever been able to come up with anything. So that's that was my question. I'm like, okay, I'm going to start with what I have and search into it. I did have a teeny tiny obituary that um, stated he uh, it was on a Friday in the Charleston Daily Mail and it said he died on Monday so I could figure mm-hmm. out what the date was um, and the Masonic Lodge in the Dunbar Masonic Lodge was performing the funeral with uh, Reverend J.L. Priestley being the officiate. Well, good. So you had some clues had there. Had some clues. Okay. Had some clues. I did. I know I had checked with the Masonic Lodge. They had mm-hmm. nothing in terms of um, funerals, uh, anything like that. They did mm-hmm. show that he was a member there. Mm-hmm. So that was a dead end. I um, contacted the library in Kanoa County, West Virginia, which is where this happened. Um, he supposedly died at the Forks of Coal, West Virginia, in a little mountain house with a family mm-hmm. cemetery somewhere nearby. Um, with the amazing uh, librarian there, the reference librarian, um, was very helpful. He spent a lot of time looking for more uh, obituaries or anything in the paper. Really didn't find anything that had a lead anywhere. Mm-hmm. So that was kind of a dead end. Um, contacted westvirginiaculture.org. That's a wonderful website. They have a lot of stuff online. Yes, they a lot do. Of great stuff Unfortunately, online. not anything for Millard. But and, nothing for um, Millard, that's too bad. So I contacted them and they said if I, uh, in working with the state archives, if I sent in a uh, physical request with a $8 fee, they would look to see maybe there would be something there that hadn't been transcribed. Mm-hmm. So okay. mailed that off. Mm-hmm. Haven't gotten an answer yet. Okay. Um, then I looked down the J.L. Priestley route, mm-hmm. the reverend, and looked, just Googled him online and uh, found that he was the pastor of a Baptist church at Forks of Coal. That's the same area. Mm-hmm. So I thought, right. okay, yeah. this, You're on the right this track. is all fitting together. Yep. And um, 
I did find a Forks of Coal Baptist Church that's mm-hmm. still active today, and I've sent them a message, mm-hmm. um, but I haven't heard anything back from them yet, okay. so still right. working on that mm-hmm. contact. Uh, but it's been really exciting. It's like once you get a little lead and you find mm-hmm. something else, and mm-hmm. then something else pops up, and you're like, oh, I can go a little further. Right. Um, so I'm kind of at a stagnant point till I hear back from mm-hmm. those two places mm-hmm. on that question. Okay. But it is leading me to another question, which I thought my second question was going to be, where are all the places that Millard lived? Uh-huh. And I was going to plot right. those out on Google Earth, which I am doing. That's great. That's a good idea. But it, <laughs> it's really leading me to another question. <laughs> wait, <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Time out, time out. It's only supposed to be one question. I know. I know. But I'm, but I'm You're stressing me the, out already. I'm on to the third question. <laughs> and the third question is, where is the cemetery? And the research that I'm doing with that mm-hmm. is so fun and exciting. I'm just, I'm like busting. I can't wait to... To blog about it, so I'm gonna I'm gonna leave that till next time. Oh, you're not gonna or, tell us the rest of the story. No, you have to look. Wait you're for gonna have blog. to wait for a blog post because oh my god, because it's not complete yet. But it, it's so exciting. So anyway, what I what I really want to convey is just asking a simple question once a week. Just a simple question: mm-hmm. Where is my grandmother's mm-hmm. birth certificate? Mm-hmm. What was somebody's middle name can lead you to mm-hmm. some mm-hmm. really great mm-hmm. detective work. I think that that is just so key to doing good genealogical research is breaking it down to those simple questions. And sometimes that will break your roadblock mm-hmm. because you, sometimes the roadblock is just too much information in front of you. And once you pull everything away and you just, just distill it down to yes. that one single question and then start analyzing like you did, you really analyze that obituary that didn't, yes. or that funeral notice. It really didn't look like it had a whole lot because it didn't right. mention anyone in the family. Nothing. Didn't even mention the date, no birth date, right. nothing, you know, nothing. but you've been able to, to track, track all those leads down. Now, some of them have been dead ends. Some mm-hmm. of them may still be dead ends, but, um, yeah, you're, yeah. you're on a roll. So that's yeah. and awesome. It's, it's that's a good. lot of fun. It's no, it's right. You're, you're, it's, it's, it's a good challenge. Yeah. So, so that leads us to, let's look at birth questions. You know, if you've, sure. or, or what birth records can lead you to other answers. Absolutely. You, right. You sure. Don't, don't not look at them for a mm-hmm for other Mm -hmm. things you're trying to find out. Right, right. Well, the first thing that we want to, we definitely want to encourage is don't rely on the indexes. I see so many people who are going on Ancestry or going on Family Search and they pull up and then there's like the Ohio birth records. And okay, well, that's the birthday there. You know, sometimes Mm. the parents have messages there. Okay, I'm done. You know, no, go get that record. Right. Because there's going to be so much more information in that record than there is in that index. And those indexes are being transcribed. They can Mm -hmm. be wrong. Mm -hmm. I've seen them. They have been, can be wrong. So always go get those, those birth and death records. And I know sometimes they're expensive, but it's worth it because you're going to save yourself so much time in the end by really delving into those records. So use the indexes to go find the documents. So we want to seek the original documents and always ask for a, cop, a photocopy of the original document. Sometimes you have a choice. The the state or the vital records office may say, we can give you a computerized copy or we can give you a photocopy of the original. Well, get the photocopy of the original. Because, it's worth the extra money for the photocopy. Yeah, if, if, there's, <clears throat> yeah, if there is an, a difference in cost because the digital copy that comes from the computer has been, somebody has actually typed that information into the computer right. and there can be error there. Right. So I've seen it in my own family's records. You know, my... My, my grandmother's father's name was completely misspelled and it's just because they couldn't read the old handwriting and so they just typed in whatever they, whatever they saw it right exactly <clears throat> so yeah those are just two cautions from the from the get-go and plus an index isn't proof of anything it's not no, so absolutely not so of course 20th century we have birth certificates those are of course the first way, way you go to prove a birth right so, and hopefully you're going to have a, you're going to have a mother's name on there for sure, because there was always a mother there when the child was born. Right. <clears throat> hopefully there's going to be a father. Sometimes there's not. Sometimes not. Sometimes it may not be the right mother. <laughs> <That's> true. <laughs> but, um, but it's going to have a place of birth. It's going to have a time of birth. Although I heard that they're not putting times of birth on birth certificates anymore. Really? Yeah. But that's a whole nother story. Um, I heard it's a rumor. Interesting. I haven't heard that. Yeah. Um, but what other types of information do we have on, on birth certificates? Well, I mean, some of them are pretty detailed, like mm-hmm. who the who the doctor was, mm-hmm. obviously the location, if it was mm-hmm. from a hospital. Mm-hmm. 
Um, or was the birth at home? Right. Was the birth at home? Was Mm -hmm. there a midwife involved? Mm -hmm. Um, Who's the informant? Yeah. Yeah. Um, But then some of them are very vague. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Uh, but birth certificates are, to analyze the birth certificate a little bit, birth certificates are always original sources. They have primary information. The primary information is important because it was given by someone who actually witnessed the event. Mm-hmm. And so, um, and it's direct evidence. Direct evidence means it's answering the question that we have of mm-hmm. where was the person born? When was the person born? Right. Hopefully it's going to be direct to who the parents were. So that is the ideal genealogical. Mm -hmm. And a birth certificate could answer a question of location if you're researching one of the parents. Like, oh, where were they at this time? As in Mm -hmm. when I'm looking at Millard's, Mm -hmm. where did he live? Mm -hmm. I went to his children's Mm -hmm. birth certificates Mm -hmm. to see where they lived during those years. So I could plot that on the map. Absolutely. Because you've got different children, different, could be born in different locations. So there could be some migration there. It's going to have the, some, most of the time they'll have the age of the parents. Mm-hmm. So that's a clue. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they'll give at least the state where they were born or country right. where they were born. So a lot of good information, not yeah. just about the individual. Um, but we know that before 1920, birth certificates are always not available. Right. Certainly for um, people who were born um, much later into the 20th century, they're sometimes not available to us legally, um, depending on what state you live in. So, um, but fortunately, um, some counties and some states do have birth records going back into the 1800s. Mm-hmm. And if you're fortunate enough to have an ancestor that came from a county that actually has the registers, um, those are great things to look for. Yeah. So always call the county, see if they have birth registers or the state archives. And don't stop if you don't see it online. Mm-hmm. Call the county clerk. Absolutely. Because those records might be available. Mm-hmm. They might even look them up for you while you wait on the phone, depending mm-hmm. on mm-hmm. You know, how busy they are, yeah. or the, the size of the of the office right. and, and whatnot. Yeah. I, I love calling places and saying, hey, I'm researching this. Do you mm-hmm. have this record? And, yeah. you know, like in West Virginia, they might say, well, you've got to come in here and look it up mm-hmm. or... Um, they might have a suggestion of Mm -hmm. how to get it or they might just give it to you. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, and a lot of the County registers are also in, um, online have been Mm -hmm. digitized and are online too. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a big help and make sure that you look for two pages because sometimes those Mm -hmm. big ledgers, they have one, you know, they go all the way across two pages. So make sure you always, you know, go forward one, go backwards one and Mm kind of look at the book and familiarize yourself with the book. So. You know what I, I did the other day, too, looking at, at pages just like that. Mm-hmm. We've always said in the census, look a few pages mm-hmm. forward and a mm-hmm. few pages backward to yeah. look at neighbors and, and mm-hmm. things like that. And mm-hmm. I think it's fun to look at the birth mm-hmm. uh, registry mm-hmm. forward and backward, too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You will be surprised that you'll find relatives that um, other birth, re- birth, birth records that you probably weren't researching at that yep. moment. But sure. There it is. Sure. And it's Relatives. worth it to make a little mm-hmm. note. Yes. Don't get sidetracked and go off on a different tangent, but, mm-hmm. you know, make a note of that's yeah. in that um, mm-hmm. same book. Yep. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, baptismal records. Um, if mm-hmm. um, the denomination that your um, ancestors belong to baptize infants, um, mm-hmm. oftentimes the churches will have those records. Some of them had made them available online, digitized. Right. Um, and the cool thing about the baptismal records is you always need to look at the sponsors or the godparents because oftentimes those are relatives. Right. right. So um, sometimes they're being, they're the namesake, you know, the child's being named after them yeah. even. So, or if they're friends and not relatives, mm-hmm. they're a clue in location. Mm-hmm. You know, if you can find sure. them in the same census, you know, or... Yeah can narrow down where everybody lived. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, one thing we do have to remember about all church records is that they are private records. They belong to the church. They are not public records and we are not entitled to them. I mean, a lot of times you think, Oh, I just call the church and I'll get the records. Mm -hmm. And most oftentimes the churches are very generous with those records, but, um, they don't have to be. So yeah, they do belong to the church and it's up to that, um, that church, um, and, uh, the people who are running, running that church and that, um, uh, particular, um, religious organization to decide. 
So, so they might they might have regulations on exactly. should you post them, should you put them mm-hmm. on your yeah. ancestry page yep. and whatnot. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So but the beauty of all of those records are again, they're all primary information. They were all created at the time of the event. So they're going to have much more accurate information mm-hmm. than some of the other documents that we're going to talk about later on. Um so what about delayed or amended birth certificates. That's something that you need oh, to look at. Those are great. Yeah. Right. you got to look to make sure, you know, does it say amended? Does it say delayed? Right. Because then you've got some other information to look for. Right. The um, In the case of Millard Stevens, when I was looking for his locations and mm-hmm. using these, I did use delayed birth certificates for four of his children. Four of his, the first four of his children that were born, I guess, didn't have a birth certificate, so mm-hmm. they got a delayed birth certificate mm-hmm. later. I don't, I can't find anything for the, all the rest of his kids, <laughs> yet. but at least these first four were there, and um, they were all. Um, their mother was still alive, so she was the person giving the, okay. the information. Mm-hmm. So if she was fairly knowledgeable, yep. I'm sure, because yep. they were married very young, um, and that's where. Uh, I got a lot of information about the parents, you know, d- confirming what county and what towns mm-hmm. they were born in. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. So, yeah. So you want to look to see mm-hmm. who the informant is. In this case, the mother, which right. was perfect. But oftentimes, you know, the mother may be deceased. So who came in? Who, w- who right. witnessed this? You know, who was giving the information? And then they usually had to bring documents, whether it was school records or a baptismal record. You know, it will usually list on the certificate what documents they brought right. to prove that information. So and that gives you some background as to um, where the information came from. Yeah. And be sure to, to do that not only for the person you're looking at. At, but like I did, I looked mm-hmm. at his children mm-hmm. or, you know, brothers and sisters. Mm-hmm. Look for, because you'll get clues on those peripheral lines. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know just one other quick little thing on one of the delayed birth certificates, the mother, Susan Chandler, had listed her name as Wealthy Susan Chandler, mm-hmm. which was perfect. It was the mm-hmm. proof I needed to prove that her she was the W.S. Chandler in the birth certificate that I found for her. That she wasn't born Susan. Mm-hmm. She was born so she had, wealthy. She had the... Um, she wasn't wealthy. Life, so. <laughs> but but it, yeah. g- it gave that other given name yeah. for her that, that yeah. differentiated her from all the other Susans. Right. And, yeah, good, good. Um, amended birth certificates, those can be a little bit more... Tr- that, can, that can be a little trickier. Um, oftentimes they're amended because the father was added later mm-hmm. or there was an adoption possibly a step parent adopted the mm-hmm. child and so mm-hmm. the step parent's name was added so i think if you have if you find an amended birth certificate you have to do a little bit more digging and be very do a little more scrutiny yeah on that record and 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 see what else i had one where it was amended and it looks to me like it's the handwriting is very hard to read but it looks like there's an attorney's name actually handwritten mm. on the, the certificate, which leads me to believe that there was, I think, a step parent adoption in, involved. So, Interesting. Unfortunately, you, we can't you can't get any more records from that particular state because they're, they have closed adoptions. So, but that's my my suspicion is that there was an, um, a step parent adoption there. Interesting. Uh, yeah, um, only because um, the index, and this is where the index can really help you. The index for this particular child, he was listed in the different surname than what the birth certificate then state was amended to. Aha. Uh-huh. So, and that was the mother's maiden name that he okay. was born under. And then the amended birth certificate has his stepfather's last name. So the marriage happened after he was born. So that so you can leads put me those to believe. Mm-hmm. Together yeah, to come exactly. Up with the story yeah. Line of what yeah, happened. yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So I hope that the bottom line here is just don't take a look at that birth certificate and look at the date of birth and the place of birth and, and the on. name and yeah. then move on. Yeah. So lots of data mining that can go yeah, on there. Absolutely. So, but what happens when we don't have those birth records, right. those original, um, primary information, birth records, where can we go to look, um, for people who were born in the latter part of the 18th century after the civil war, uh, social security applications mm-hmm. if they lived if those individuals lived i in my experience if they lived into the 1960s then you have a better shot at trying to get those um yeah. those ss5s and you can order those online um, the ss5 is the application that you fill out to apply to get a social security number um i don't know what the form is i forget the, what the, the name of the form is to um 
apply to get the copy. Uh, it seemed to work works best for me if I just order online rather than print and mail the copy in. Uh-huh. If I print and mail the order in, I don't always get something in return. But when I do it online, I get something get always. Right away. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's going to now. This is self reporting. So this is not primary information. This is going to be secondary information because this is a document that was created um, much, much later, usually after the person was born. Right. And um, But it's hopefully, if you're lucky and they haven't redacted the information, which sometimes they do, the government will, but it will give parents' names, it will give a woman's maiden name, her place or his place of birth, and their birth date as far as what they knew, the, mm-hmm. you know, they're giving mm-hmm. information as they knew it as adults, but right. it's a great, um, wonderful tool. It does cost $21 and you don't know for sure what you're going to get. Right. Or but, even if it's the right person. Sometimes. Right. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, but if they, especially if you find them, if they were born before birth records and you know that there is no birth certificate for them, mm-hmm. for instance, my grandmother, she was born in 1893. So there was, and there was no birth record for her. So um, the SS five, then I was able to prove, you know, her parents, and it matched her death. Actually, you know what? Well, it didn't match her death because my aunt didn't put her mother's name on her birth death certificate. Right. I don't know why. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> that's Thank another you. issue, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> so, but you're able to get, you know, to, to prove that, you know, as far as she knew, those were her parents. Yeah. So um, it's it's great. It's, it's a great resource. Um, what else? Where else can we go? Especially for that that time period, right after the Civil War. Oh, military records. How about mm-hmm. that? Absolutely. Those World War One draft cards. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Got to put all that information on there. So, um, but again, just b- besides birth date, because yeah. the man put his birth date down there, and he put where he was born. Well, you hope he put the right birth date down. Well, that's true. That's true. That's because true. they might have put another date down just to get in. To get, to get in or to stay out? <laughs> to get in or to stay get, out. That's right. That's true. So we have to understand motivation. <laughs> uh, but it will also give, uh, it also gives their, their next of kin or who they're living mm-hmm. with. Yes. Um, so you find out if they're married. You know, if you're looking for a marriage record, you can go, okay, well, at least they, I know he was married by this date or he was not married by yes. that date. Um, I don't like it when they put, like... Uh, if it's John Smith, their mm-hmm. wife is Mrs. Mrs. John, John Smith. Smith. Right. Yeah. Very um, frustrating. <laughs> Very frustrating. Sometimes you'll give an address. Yes. Um, and I'll get back to that in a second. But it also gives the descriptions, which is really cool. Because you kind of get an idea yeah. of hair color, right. eye color, That's you know, yes, yeah, scars, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So that's kind of cool. So those are really neat um, if you can get those. Um, where The really, how I used uh, or World War One. um Registra- uh, draft card was I had a family with men who were born about the same age who are cousins with the same name. Oh my gosh. So you have John Smith 1 and John Smith 2, let's yeah. say. And they were both born 1890 to 1895. Okay. So I had the two draft cards, but which one was which? So what I did was I took, I looked at the addresses that they put, you know, where they were living, right. and then I cross referenced those addresses with the census records awesome. that were closest to, um, you know, I don't, 1920 yes. or maybe it was maybe New York. So I could even use the New York state from 1915. And then I could differentiate the two based on where they were living. I knew which one went to which family. Nice. And then I could assign the birth record, the birth, the birth date that way. Nice. So again, you're not just looking yeah, for you have to the look date up. and the place, but you can just mine those for a lot of good, good information. Right. Uh, other military records later on would be um, the DD 214s when the men were being discharged, especially from World War II. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can get those under Freedom of Information Act. Um, many of the um, Army records were destroyed in St. Louis in the 70, 72 right. fire, but they still have the DD 214s, which will give. Um, place of birth or at least a state i don't know if it gives a city but at least a state of birth and their date of birth so yeah. it give, it does give some some information as well as i think it does it does list some of their military um assignments okay. so yeah. um you know we had i had what case where um grandfather was born in 1920s we're still not sure if he was born in kentucky or illinois because the family kind of went back and forth mm-hmm. No, and in Illinois, you have to know the county to be able to get the birth record. And we just, 
had no luck. Um, and Kentucky had no birth record either, but his CD 214 says, according to him, he was born in Kentucky. So okay. for right now, that's what we have to go with until we can. But I find it interesting. Um, you say that it'll have, um, a list of their military, it if it does, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. but, but that's always something that you can then Google or, or try to find yeah. out. And there might be, um, you could, I, I'm just really stretching it here. Like mm-hmm. if you're really stumped on something mm-hmm. with that ancestor, there might be something out there that another um, soldier in that uh, regiment had written um, about in a diary or something like that. So let's move on to pension records. Pensions are gold mines of information. Yeah, they are. Um, and you can find those at NARA. Or National Archives. Fold 3. Through Fold 3, mm-hmm. yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, Revolutionary War. Um, those are important because uh, the uh, the pensioner would often give some biographical information about himself. At least uh, w- the birth date or year that he thinks that he was born in. It's not going to be particularly accurate, but it's going to be his memory um, of when he was born and where he was born. So that gives you location and mm-hmm. gives you an approximate year. Um, so those are wonderful for those uh, Revolutionary War pension um, applications. And those are mostly available online um, through Fold 3. Yeah. And Civil War as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, so, Confederate has state archives. Yes. The Confederate uh, um, pension applications, again, wonderful. They're going to have um, birth date, location, if it's a widow's pension, mm-hmm. where they were married, where she was born. Um, some biographical information about the couple there. Um, oftentimes, they will have relatives in all of these pensions because they had to bring witnesses forward. Right. And oftentimes, they served with relatives. So they had right. people they knew who knew them well would come forward. So you can need to look at, look who the witnesses sure. are and trace those down as possible family members. And again, it might be a reverse case of you're not looking for John Smith's actual application, but... The letter from his cousin Joe, Mm -hmm. that might be the information you really want because you're researching Joe. So in researching Joe, look for people that might have Mm -hmm. a pension record out Mm -hmm. there that he Mm -hmm. might have written for them. Mm -hmm. I mean, you never know where this information is going to pop up. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's that's for sure. You a good detective. (laughs) Yes. Um, For a Civil War, um, U.S. Army pension records, those are available um, through the National Archives. I would encourage you to write to the National Archives and get copies of those. Um, I found a tremendous amount of information going there and actually looking at the original applications. Tons of stuff that has not been digitized or yeah. in those records. So definitely awesome. look at that. Yeah. It's also the Indian Wars, if, if you're in Yes, absolutely. Unfortunately, those are not digitized. So you have to go to National Archives and request them. They do have digitized the indexes. Okay. So you can at least know if there was a pension record there. Else. Yeah, you get the numbers and everything. But then you have to write and get okay. those or go visit um, the National Archives. And 1812, they're still working on. They've got about 66%. Yes, exactly. Digitized. Yeah, about two million, almost 2 million records. So they're doing a good That's job. That's awesome. Those are on Fold 3. Um, and let me just go back for a second because I said that the um, Indian War appli- um, pension applications are with um, the National Archives. If you want to go see them, you need to find which archives they're at. For instance, the Florida Indian Wars are not in Washington, D.C. They're actually in, in Morrow, Georgia, near, in the Atlanta area oh. at, the, at, at the National Archives there. So make sure before you make okay. a trip that you right. know where those are being housed. Do so not everything is in Washington. Sure. Yeah. Um, I know we've talked about naturalization records before mm-hmm. and passport applications mm-hmm. in previous yeah. podcasts. There are a yeah. wealth of information. Absolutely. In but you're going to have birth um, information, locations, mm-hmm. often cities if you know in Europe where your ancestor came from, and that's going to give you mm-hmm. a huge jump, mm-hmm. um, especially if they're you know German. You have to know the town where they were from, and right. then that opens up a whole bunch of uh, church records for you if you get those naturalization records. Um, it also will give the um, spouse, mm-hmm. birth date, birth location, where they were married, when they were married, and any children that they had. And, and if they know their birth dates. Right. I've, I've had the experience where the father wrote down all the wrong birth dates. Oh, my gosh. But um, if it was the mom, probably would have had a better, <laughs> better chance on that. But um, but still, and if you're researching a child or a person, look for their parents' naturalization records that might have their birth dates listed on there. If you can't find the birth date, that's just another avenue to look at. Yes. 
Absolutely. Uh, let's see. Oh, passport applications. Passport applications. Mm-hmm. Passport sure. applications, yes. Um, before 1925, if your ancestor had an, a passport before 1925, those records, those applications are mm-hmm. with the National Archives. If it was 1925, then there's like, I think, like June, or I think mean, there's a middle in 1925, some date, exact date, mm-hmm. when they transferred to State Department the passport division. So you have to actually go to the passport division to get records after okay. at about 1925. And those are fun to look at too. Yeah. If, you, if you have an ancestor yeah. that went for that, um, Bible records, they're anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're in somebody's closet or yeah. attic or yeah. So, but. um, but if you do come across Bible records, the, especially the original Bible records, always make a copy of the, Frontispiece piece of the Bible, yep. the publication information, because that is very important to know when that Bible was created, the book itself. Right. Because then it puts that information that was handwritten in there in context. Right. And you can tell if it's really early and then somebody wrote an in ink, you know, a clearly a ballpoint pen that's later. Right. Yeah. Yes. So you really well. need to, right. If, if the births or the records are plus or minus one generation from when that Bible was written was created and published, then you might have to be a little bit more skeptical about those. Right. The people who were writing the the dates in there may not have actually known those people. Right. So, And census records, of course, we all know um, that they'll mm-hmm. sometimes list the month and year. Yeah, 1900, and 1900 census, right. Um, and they sometimes mm-hmm. change the places from census to census. That's right. So. It's, it's all secondary information. Yeah. You don't even know who okay. was giving that information. Right. And, yeah, we run across errors. Again, we're it's having a... to analyze all of this, all this information we yeah. get collectively, and then you can co- start yes. to form an idea of what the truth may be out of right. all this information that you've and collected. And be sure when you're doing this that you're writing all this down as you on your research log. As you find it, make a notation of what you found, mm-hmm. and then you can see the big picture Absolutely. more clearly. Because you don't want to go back and... You've already found the naturalization papers, but you didn't write it down. And after weeks of researching, you're like, oh, what about naturalization papers? And you start all over again. Yes. So make sure you log, yes. it, log it all in. Um, another thing that you've written down are bastardy bonds. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Those are filed in the county um, for children who were born um, out of wedlock. Oftentimes the county would go after the, the father because the county didn't want to have to provide for right. the child. So they wanted to... Um, to locate the father. So um, those would be located either with the state archives or still with the county. County. So, mm -hmm, absolutely. And, of course, marriage applications usually list something. Well, not usually, but... It's a good chance that they'll it's list. you know it yeah it depends on which state you are talking about and the time period and the time period you're talking about you know I've I've seen some wonderful Ohio oh my gosh in the early 20th century they have parents names parents um, occupations mm-hmm. if there's a prior divorce they even get the divorce case number I mean tons of great stuff wow. and here in Florida it's just the husband's name the wife's name and the date and place of birth yeah. and of marriage and that's it yeah. However, I will also t- say that you should always ask to see if there is an application separate from the license. Um, here in Florida, that was the case. Starting in 1927, um, they started having the um, couple fill out an application for the license. And that often gave a little bit more biographical information, like where they were born, um, their birth date, and it might give, if they were underage or needed a parent's mm-hmm. consent, then it might have some parental information on it. And those are filed separate from the license. So if you just go and you ask, I need this, you know, proof of marriage, right. you're just going to get the license. They're not going to give you the application. The you application. have to ask for them. So ask, um, yeah. or, and be insistent until you find a knowledgeable clerk. So, because I've, I've had clerks tell me, nope, we don't have those. I'm like, yes, yes, you do. Yeah. So be persistent, but, yeah, um, always, good, always ask. Good hint. Um, and I guess just some other things with that listed well, here. Things that you, other places, other ways that you can find, um, birth records, um, would be through obituaries, sure. death certificates, tombstones. Um, but those are all, well, those were all records that were created after the person died. Right. Not anywhere near the time that they were born. So we really have to continue to look for records that you want to get as close as you can to the actual event. Right. Because those records are probably a lot closer to the truth. Right. I think there's been one, I think the example I gave was, um, there was a grandmother in the family who, um, 
basically on her marriage record, she, she lied about her age because she wasn't old enough mm-hmm. to get married without parental consent. Mm-hmm. Um, so you have to keep looking, you know, balance the census records with these vital records to come to the whole, the big right. picture there. I think it, I think, it, you know, as you guys are listening to our stories, you're finding a lot of our ancestors lied a lot about stuff. <laughs> You know, marriage dates and birth dates, and there's there's a lot of fibbing going on um, in the past. <laughs> it's very important to understand the historical the, the mm-hmm. historical context in which right. those records were created, and yeah. what were the reasons, or why why may they why may the wrong ad, the wrong date be put on there? Yeah. So yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, it is. It's. I just. I love doing this little detective work and answering these questions and finding um, and solving some mysteries. So, we hope that you all will come up with a question um, a week to answer or a month, and you know, start solving your family mysteries just a little bit at a time. And I think it'll get you re-excited or rejuvenated, and or you know, back into your genealogy research. It could really help you break down some brick walls absolutely. or absolutely really say, you know, if you're to the point where you're like, I just don't know where to start. I don't know where to go. Just take that one little question and just answer that. Yes. And it will just start leading you um, down that trail. Right. To answering more questions and, and we'd getting love a bigger to, picture. And we'd love to hear about your questions too. If you've answered or solved a mystery, um, please let us know. Uh, write us a Message on Facebook at Genealogy Happy Hour or email us at genealogyhappyhour at gmail.com um, and check out our blog post, which hopefully there will be more of this year in answering our mystery questions. Thank you, Penny, for doing the blog. Yeah. All right. Until next time. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you for listening. Please email us with any questions or comments at genealogyhappyhour at gmail.com. Visit our website, www.genealogyhappyhour.com, for additional resources, books, and wines. Don't forget to drink responsibly. And never drink around genealogical documents.